Uh, now, Professor Lal. Vinay Lal is a writer, blogger, cultural critic, and professor of history and Asian American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He earned his PhD with distinction from the University of Chicago in 1992. After undergraduate and master's degree in literature and philosophy from John Hopkins University. He writes widely on Indian history, historiography, the Indian diaspora, colonialism, the architecture of nonviolence, Gandhi, American politics, contemporary culture, and the global politics of knowledge systems. His 20 some books, such as the two volume Oxford Anthology of the Modern City, etc., are highly popular, especially academically. He also edited and co edited a few books. His scholarly work has been translated into Hindi, Urdu, Kannada, French, German, Spanish, Finnish, Korean, and Persian. And his shorter essays and popular writings have been translated into some 40 languages, including Portuguese, Estonian, Ukrainian, Slovak, Russian, Bosnian, Polish, Albanian, Greek, Indonesian, and Thai. Three of his forthcoming books include The Artist and Insurgency, The Art of the Freedom Struggle in India, and the two volume of his collected papers on Gandhi. A book on the history of colonial India told through stories, a study of internet Hinduism, etc., are his works in progress. He also has been the he also has the distinction of being listed among the 101 most dangerous professors in America in David Harovich's book. He blogs at vinaylal.wordpress.com and at abplive.in. His academic YouTube channel at youtube.com slash user slash Dilli Chalo has nearly 2.5 million views. In fact, I myself am a very frequent visitor of this academic channel. The podium is yours, sir, Professor Lal, the dangerous professor, to show the red placard for the Rogue Rugby Cultural Hawks. To you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, the generous introduction and for the uh, invitation. Uh, my thanks to everyone in the Anek Dhara team. Uh, let me say that uh, I'm uh, that Professor Roy has uh, uh, displayed remarkable discipline, and I'm not sure I will be able to emulate uh, the brevity with which she has been able to uh, give forth a very sustained and rigorous argument. She has also, at the same time, laid the groundwork in some respects for what I want to say, in particular with respect to the question of the quotidian and the question of hospitality, which I will come to. Let me, let me begin with two stories. The first is a story drawn from somewhere other than India. It's a story that I read in a book by Mark Mazover, who's a historian at Columbia. And it's an extraordinary book on a city, a biography of a city, Salonika, also known as Thessalonica, uh, in the Greek world. Now, this is a city which has had a very cosmopolitan past. On one single street, literally yards from each other, you could see at one point a mosque, a Greek Orthodox church, a Syrian Orthodox church, a mosque, and various other religious establishments. In the early 1940s, the Nazis came to Salonika. And the first thing the Nazi commander asked when he arrived with the troops was, where is the ghetto? Where is the Jewish ghetto? Because Salonika had also a Jewish population. And on that same street where you found all these religious establishments, there was a synagogue of, as well. And he was told, much to his astonishment, there is no ghetto in Salonika. And so he writes back to Berlin, to the headquarters in Berlin saying, these people are civilized, are, un are uncivilized. 
they have not been properly tutored because they don't understand that a Jewish person belongs only in a ghetto and nowhere else. Now, this is in part the story of empires. I'm not nostalgic about empires by any stretch of the imagination, but I think empires, historians will often argue, were in many ways far more cosmopolitan and ecumenical than the nation state. This is really a parable also about the problem of the nation state, because the kind of hospitality that an empire could offer is something that nation states, it seems to me, are incapable of doing so. The nation state is the modular form in which the political community survives today. And this is part of what I want to really argue is that the problem of India today is partly the problem of the nation state. It is not only the problem of India, it is a problem everywhere in the world. Because I believe that the nation state is a particular form of political community, which by definition is actually inhospitable. The second story is drawn from Rabindranath Tagore. In the early 1920s, he visited China and he gave a number of lectures there. And those lectures, which were given and delivered in English, have been collected together in the English writings of Rabindranath Tagore. There are a number of different collections of that, but there's a beautiful multi volume edition of that by Sahitya Academy in the English writings. And one of these lectures, he describes to the audience what happened when the Northwest frontier was bombed by air from the British. This is, of course, pre 1947. So this is the time when India was undivided. And this is when the Masoods, which is one group, one Pathan group really, was being pacified from the air by the British. One of these fighter aircrafts that had actually bombed the villages there, that very same aircraft had to make an emergency landing in the middle of the village. And the two airmen tried to bail out of, so when the plane lands, it's going to blow up, of course, in flames and momentarily. And so they quickly are trying to exit from the, from the burning wreckage. And they are surrounded by the same villagers who had been bombed just moments ago by these two airmen. But these two airmen are gingerly rescued, taken out of the burning aircraft. And they're taken to a nearby cave where they are fed and nursed back to health before being sent back to the border so they can go back into British India. According to a Masood, Tagore explains to his audience because the audience of course, was wondering, what is this about? I mean, and this seems very odd that the very same people who have been just bombed are now offering this kind of hospitality. And so Tagore says in his lecture, and I quote here, according to a Masood, hospitality is a quality by which he is known as a man, and therefore he cannot afford to miss his opportunity, even when dealing with someone who can be systematically relentless in enmity. From the practical point of view, the Masood pays for this very dearly, as we must always pay for that which we hold most valuable. It is the mission of civilization to set for us the right standard of valuation. The Masood may have many faults for which he should be held accountable, but that which has imparted for him more value to hospitality than to revenge may not be called progress, but is certainly civilization." End quote. Now, we're here to talk about composite culture. There are a great many words, the composite culture of India, there are a great many words that we can think about, which as Wittgenstein would have said, bear a family resemblance. When we're thinking about composite culture, we can also think about plurality, we can think about diversity, we can think about what is often called the syncretic culture, particularly syncretic culture of the Indo-Islamic cultural synthesis, as it were, that was created in India. Right? And I think it is important to understand how it's, we don't have the luxury here of being able to distinguish between all of these terms, but it's very important, it seems to me, to be able to understand how what we are calling the composite culture or the kind of 
plurality we have had in India differs from notions of diversity, which are now being universalized around the world, much like the whole idea of multiculturalism. In the United States and in much of the West, I would argue, this recourse to diversity and multiculturalism should be understood as a model where we think of how it filters from top down. Whereas in India, it seems to me there was always diversity on the ground in various ways. So we have to think of it ground up. Right? When we're thinking of composite culture in particular, this very idea, as that is to say, as a historical idea, actually has a certain genealogy. One could always say that it was in there in practice, but as often as the case, the practice precedes the theory, so to speak. And really, when we use the phrase itself, what we're really thinking about is the contributions of a number of different people and texts in the early 20th century or first half of the 20th century. For example, a work by Tara Chand called The Influence of Islam on Indian Culture, a work by Kishti Mohan Sen called Hindu Musalmane or Jukto Shadna, which is roughly you can translate as a joint meditation on the Hindu and the Musalman or the Muslim. And for example, the report, a very extraordinary report actually, published by um, a Congress committee appointed to inquire into the Kanpur riots in 1931, which vastly exceeded the brief that had been given to the committee. When being asked to inquire into the circumstances that had led to the riot, it decided to offer a huge resume of the whole past of Hindu-Muslim relations in India. And this is where, in texts like these, the ideas of composite culture was first really, in a way, theorized by historians and by other public figures. Now, it is the case, and I think that this was mentioned by Gagarin in his introduction, that most discussions of composite culture revolve really around Hindu-Muslim relations or what we might call the Indo-Islamic synthesis or more broadly, Hindu-Muslim syncretism because Indo-Islamic cultural synthesis and what is called the Ganga Jamuna Tezib, this of course refers to you know North India, particularly the Doab. But let's not forget, for example, I mean, and I can't really mention this or discuss this in detail, but let's not forget that many of the courts, uh, the Muslim courts in the Deccan were actually very cosmopolitan. They had, for example, very interesting links with Persia, right? I mean, we often think when we think of the grand Muslim culture, we are thinking of the Mughals court, but the Deccani courts are no less interesting in their own way. But whichever set of courts we look at, it is clearly the case that it is really relations between Hindu and Muslims that most people are thinking of when they're thinking of the composite culture of India. More particularly because the adherents of these two faiths constitute the majority, the preponderant majority or over 90% of the population of India. And in the first instance, I think we should certainly attempt to broaden out the discussion beyond Hindu-Muslim relations as indeed Professor Roy has already done when she has gone to the Jataka you know, corpus. We can't forget, of course, that much of North India was Buddhist before it was Hindu. I say this with the awareness that no one described himself or herself as a Hindu in ancient India, or indeed in nearly all of the history of pre-colonial India. They were Vaishnavas, they were Shaivites, they were Shaktos, Tantrics, Ajivikas or Charvakas, Jains, Buddhists, later on Kabir Panthis, Nanak Panthis, the adherents of the cult of Goraknath, and others far too numerous to mention. For instance, some of the groups that are discussed in Shashi Bhushan Das Gupta's wonderful book, very old but wonderful book called Obscure Religious Cults as Background of Bengali Literature from 1946 or the kinds of groups that are discussed in Eliade's book, Yoga, Immortality, and Freedom, which also include groups such as the Bauls, uh, the, you know, the ecstatic mystic minstrels of West Bengal and now rural Bangladesh, uh, 
uh, whose songs and music have now been recognized by UNESCO as part of the intangible heritage of India. Right? The point here is simply this, that not all of these groups, in fact, the groups that Shashi Bhushan Das Gupta discusses are communities, groups, that in many ways disavowed bookish learning altogether. So when we're thinking of the composite culture of India, we should think not simply of those people who are bookish, but we should also those think of those who renounced books, writing. We should think of the Vedic and the Avedic and so on with the recognition that Hinduism is, of course, the corporate category through which we think about many of the things in the past. Now, the composite culture of India was never only a case of considering Hindu-Muslim relations. Consider, for example, the case very briefly of the Parsis and the Jews. Right? Their numbers, of course, I recognize were very small. And I recognize this in particular as an argument now, because I think one should be able to anticipate the objection that, well, you know, their numbers were so minuscule that they never really posed a threat. For those who would like to posit the idea that, well, the whole idea of Hindu tolerance as it was known, right, that word hasn't come up in the discussion yet, but, but the, the whole idea of Hindu tolerance, that this is a fiction, as has sometimes been argued. And so therefore, when you refer to, let's say, the Jews and the Parsis, they'll say that, well, their numbers are really so small. Um, I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, let us also recall that even though the numbers of the Jews were very small, even in that minuscule number, you actually had very distinct communities. So you had the Cochin Jews, you had the Baghdadi Jews, you had the Bene Israel, right? And with regard to the question of their numbers being very small, I want to just remind everybody since, and this is a terrain I know quite well as a student of the Indian diaspora for a long time, is that, you know, when there were fewer than 1,000 Indians in the United States, and here I'm talking about the early 1900s, really early 1900s, yeah? There was a racial riot that took place in Western Washington in Bellingham against the Hindus, as they were called. And by the way, the Sikhs were included in the Hindus because that was the only language that, that white America knew at that time. There was no separate classification. At that time, the newspapers were full of headlines such as Hindu hordes attack America, literally. Right? So it's not simply a question of numbers. I think it is a question here of how one thinks about the other. So what can we say here about the Jews of India? Jews acculturated and not simply assimilated into Indian society. They retained their very distinct characteristics, their forms and modes of worship, and so on. Here is the verdict of one scholar. Quote, Jews navigated the eddies and shoals of Indian culture very well. They never experienced anti-Semitism or discrimination at Indian hands. They contributed to Indian civilization in a variety of secular arts and medicine and commerce, cinema, politics, agriculture, and the military. Indian Jews lived as all Jews should have been allowed to live. And, you, and here, let me pause. And of course, when the minute you read this, you know that this is being written by someone who is writing with the awareness of the long history of anti-Semitism in nearly every other part of the world, and especially in Europe and the United States. And this, author, this scholar continues. So he says, Indian Jews lived as all Jews should have been allowed to live, free, proud, observant, creative, and prosperous, self-realized, full contributors to the community, end quote. Now, you might think to yourself that, that a scholar who's writing this is someone who is evidently proud of Indian culture, perhaps a Hindu nationalist. Well, this is an American Jewish scholar, Nathan Katz, who wrote a book called Who Are the Jews of India, published by U University of California Press in 2000. And of course, when he's speaking about their contribution, one can think, for example, of the wonderful poet Nizim Ezekiel. One can think of the fact 
that so many institutions having to do with social reform in Bombay and Pune are named after the Sassoon family because the Sassoon family is the family that contributed to these orphanages, to these hospitals and so on. And one could make much the same argument apropos of the Parsis. Their contributions are far too numerous to be able, for me to be able to enumerate, of course, and quite unnecessary to do so at this particular juncture. Apart from their critical importance in the early years of the Indian National Congress, in the making of Bombay itself, and so on. Now, when we get to the question of colonial and modern India, let me begin. I'm going to take up two or three. So unlike Professor Roy, whose strategy here has been quite different, and, and mine is complementary in a way that she's looked at one sort of study in particular in some detail, I'm simply here giving you a, a different kind of sweep, a different way, a different set of a set of ways to enter into this kind of discussion that we are having about the nature of our composite culture. And of course, in my closing remarks, I will move to the whole question of what are the perils that face India today when we think about this composite culture. Some years ago, Harjot Abroy wrote what I, what in my judgment, at least other historians may naturally take a different view, but we all rest upon the work of fellow scholars as well in various ways. He wrote in what in my judgment is really an extraordinary book. It's a book called The Construction of Religious Boundaries, Culture, Identity and Diversity in the Sikh Tradition. And it's a book for which he got into enormous trouble with the Sikh community. Because one of the things that he was trying to establish there, there is of course a very contentious scholarship on this question since then as well. And, and this question of course had been at the heart of many of the discussions. Um, in the Sikh tradition. But one of the things that he's trying to establish is that there never really was any kind of boundary as such between the Sikhs and the Hindus. And there were colonial authors who themselves recognized this very much. For example, if you look at Ibbotson, who in his report on the census of the Punjab in 1881 had this to say. But on the borderlands, he writes, where these great faiths meet, writing about Sikhism and Hinduism, and especially among the ignorant peasantry, whose creed, by whatever name it may be known, is seldom more than a superstition and a ritual, the various observances and beliefs which distinguish the followers of the several faiths in their purity are so strangely blended and intermingled that it is often impossible to say that one prevails rather than other, or to decide in what category the people shall be classed, right? And, and I want to emphasize, you know, Ibbotson's um, uh, 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 description of the people who refuse to segregate these faiths, so to speak, as the ignorant, right? And this is, of course, another way of hearkening to the quotidian that in everyday life and in everyday cultural practices, it was often impossible to distinguish. Not only between Sikhism and Hinduism, but Hinduism and Islam, as we shall see, right? And this is, so the, the, the bulk of what Harjot Singh of Roy is going to argue here is to, is to suggest how we should think about Sikhism and Hinduism. How is it that a border, a boundary came between the two? What was the role of the Sikh Sabha? For example, in this, in the late 19th century, their discomfort with the idea of multiplicity within the Sikh identity, because if I may put it this way, that when these boundaries begin to close, right, as they are closing in India today, they also close not simply between, between faiths, but within each faith. Within each faith, these boundaries begin to close. And that's what he's trying to demonstrate here, that first, the ideas of multiplicity within the Sikh, Sikh faith are going to gradually be eviscerated. 
and he and his book is an extraordinary demonstration of how really that game comes to happen. Now there is another way in which we can begin to understand this, and and I understand that some people may or may not go along with this. I mean, for example, Romila Thapares and many others have spoken about, with reference to uh, Hindu nationalism of the last couple of last two three decades, especially, uh, not simply by the way since, since 2014. But but long before that, because let's forget, let's not forget that that the destruction of the Babri Masjid took place in 1992, on 6 December 1992. That's long before the present regime came into power, right? And people like her and others have, and some others have been arguing about what they have called the Semitization of Hinduism, right? We can we can think of another term as well, and that term that I would would want to use because this is a term which it seems to me actually takes us more precisely to the nature of the problem. And that is the particular way in which every religion in the world, beginning in the early 19th century, the process goes back to the early 19th century, began to fashion itself in the shape of Protestant Christianity. Protestant Christianity in particular, right? And this holds true of Islam, it holds true of Hinduism, it holds true of Buddhism. Right? And this is, of course, one of the templates in which we have to really think of somebody like Ramon Roy. Now, um, just to give you one or two more examples, and then I'll quickly draw to a conclusion. And I can elaborate upon these examples, you know, at much greater detail if anyone has any interest and if there's time in the QA. So, um, like some other people who write on colonial India and modern India, I've long been interested in the whole problem of, of Gujarat. Um, and, and in particular, when the incident took place at Godhra, uh, my interest was really peaked and I began to look at what are called the imperial gazetteers. So one of the many projects of the colonial state, what I have elsewhere described as the epistemological imperatives of the colonial state, one of those projects was to produce this massive series of what are called the Imperial Gazetteers. Um, and if you look at the Imperial Gazetteers series and you look at the two volumes of the Bombay presidency, it makes for remarkable reading, really remarkable reading. Because if I had to put it in, put it in a nutshell, the colonial ethnographers went looking for difference. They went looking to differentiate very clearly between the Hindus and between the Muslims. And in every volume of this series, not simply the volumes having to do with the Bombay presidency, they found that they were running into enormous difficulties in doing so. Because they would find, for example, Muslim cultivators in Ratlam, worshiping Sitala, and following the Hindu customs in their marriages. They talk about the Mayos, about which of course Shal Mayaram and others have written in more recent decades of Alwar and Bharatpur, right? But to get to the point, it is really Gujarat where they found the greatest degree of what we might simply call mixing, Gujarat in particular. Right? And of course, one has to then attempt to understand what is the relationship of all of that to what has transpired in Gujarat in recent years. So Gujarat, for example, they found had, has more than its fair share of non-Sunni Muslims. Many of them were deemed inauthentic Muslims already by the Orthodox, who read neither the Quran nor offered daily prayers, and instead kept the pictures of Swami Narayan in their houses and worshipped them. These same gazetteers relate to us the story of the Husseini Brahmins. Just think of the phrase, Husseini Brahmins, who describe themselves as followers of the Atharva Veda, but derive their name from Imam Hussein, the grandson of the prophet. Though not converts to Islam, they had adopted those Islamic beliefs, which were more easily reconcilable with Hinduism, and so on, right? So I, I think that the gist of what I'm trying to suggest here should be very clear. And I have a long discussion, which I will omit here and simply get to my concluding remarks, because I had a discussion here of um, 
Ghazi Mian, uh, uh, around which, about which uh, one of India's finest historians, Shahid Amin, has written a wonderful book published some years ago, a few years ago. Um, and I had some remarks, of course, about the Ganga Jamuna Tazib as well. But here I want to really talk about, in the concluding five minutes, let's say, about what we might call the perils of the kind of homogenization that is taking place today. I mean, many commentators have argued. I don't think that it is incorrect to argue that way at all. Many commentators have argued, looking at the present trends, that there seems to be a tendency to want to establish something like a Hindu Rashtra in India today, right? Now, I won't really comment per se on that. What I do want to comment on is to suggest where we can see some of the problems cropping up. What are the forms of uh, homogenization that are taking place in India and how do they pose a particular problem for those who stand by the idea that there has been in India a composite culture. We may not be the only, I remember I started with a story from Salonika, we may not be the only civilization in the world, perhaps we have that conceit that we think we are the only or the greatest civilization to have this composite culture, it is again, I think, unnecessary to entertain that thought. But what is certainly very clear is that, that the kind of composite culture that we have had, it seems to me, is in peril today. For example, think about the whole endeavor to de Arabicize and de Persianize our languages Hindi. Right? And there have been certainly either pronouncements or actions by the government, which certainly suggest this kind of trend. Consider, for example, the various attempts, really blatantly open attempts to falsify the past, right? I mean, I, you know, uh, 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 Professor Roy would be able to weigh in on this. I mean, I visited the National Museum um, at Janpa just before uh, the coronavirus pandemic struck, you know. And I was astonished by something there. I was looking at the whole exhibit, which had to do with Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, right? And of course, th this doesn't involve Muslims or this or that, really. What it involves is colonial officials, because we have heard the story of how they came upon this. What is really interesting there is that in the exhibit, there, the colonial state has completely disappeared. It's just disappeared, right? I mean, and, and, and so, you know, this, this may not really have a bearing on the composite culture as such. It is simply an illustration of what I'm arguing about attempts to falsify the past, right? Um, what happens to, for example, Mughal art in India? How is it going to be displayed? I certainly, and I don't believe these are only rumors. I have certainly seen references to attempts to try to eviscerate some of this from our museums. My particular concern is the textbook. Um, I have written very extensively on what I call the culture of the textbook. I think the textbook is a pedal to thinking everywhere in the world. And there are reasons why we should not use textbook because what is a textbook? And why is it that the present government and again, let us be very clear, it's not only the present government that has been tinkering with textbooks. These, some of these problems go back several decades. It's just that now they have taken on a new life. They have become considerably aggravated in various ways, right? Why is a textbook so critically important to the nation state? It is as critically important to the nation state as a national symbol, as a national flag as a national anthem, as a national language. We don't have a national language. I'll come to that in a moment, right? But most countries do. The vast majority of countries in the world do. And everywhere what the textbook does is it helps to produce not simply a homogenized history, it helps to produce a proper subject of a proper nation state. And here I'm using the word proper, of course, ironically. That is to someone who can be easily a subject who can become docile, obedient, much as Immanuel Kant had described when he described what the function of schooling was, 
right? Notwithstanding all the great liberal ideas we have about schooling, what exactly it is that schooling really does, how it makes us obedient, and in this case, obedient to the nation state. Now, we do not have a national language, and in my view, not widely shared, perhaps, and certainly not shared by anyone in the present administration of India, we do not have a national language, and that is for the better, I think. It is certainly for the better, right? What is it that Amit Shah said on 14 September 2019, of course, in a tweet. That's the only way the government of India communicates is through tweets. Quote, India is a country of different languages and every language has its own importance, but it is very important to have a language which should become the identity of India in the world. If one language can unite the country today, it is a widely spoken Hindi language, end quote. And let us keep in mind what the Indian constitution says, Article 343, that the official language of the union shall is Hindi, sorry, uh, 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 it shall be Hindi in the Devnagri script, official language, not national language. And then Articles 346 and Articles 347, as well as the Official Languages Act, also mention English as the other official language in which the business of the union government and the parliament can be conducted. Every state can, of course, have its own official language in addition, right? But we do not have a national language, and we should consider why it is that this government is so keen on trying to push for one. Right? Now, last set of comments. There is a familiar language in which all of this is often discussed. For example, unity and diversity. It may be a cliche. It certainly is a cliche, but it is not going to go away anytime soon. Can we, however, speak of this issue in a different language? Because I think it is imperative that we learn to live with difference. What I called hospitality, going back to my story from Tagore, and the idea of being hospitable are ways to think through this. How can we be hospitable to others and host the difference of the other within ourselves? Hosting, so to speak, the otherness of the other within ourselves. There is now a large and still growing literature on the question of religion and secularism, which is one avenue into this. But I would like to end here with an insight from Mohandas Gandhi. With regards to the argument that I'm presently advancing, Gandhi is important in the same way that Ghaffar Khan is important with regards to this argument, namely that just as Gandhi derived his secularism from being a devout Hindu in his own fashion, Ghaffar Khan derived his secularism from being a devout Muslim. What Gandhi also said is this, if you are a Hindu and you believe in the power of prayer, then pray not that the Muslim, Christian or Buddhist should become a Hindu, but rather that the Muslim should become a better Muslim, a Christian, a better Christian, a Buddhist, a better Buddhist. Similarly, if you are a devout Muslim, pray not that the Hindus, Mus Christians, Jains, Buddhists, and others should become Muslims, but rather that Hindus should become better Hindus, Christians, better Christians, and so on. And likewise, of course, that is how Jains and Buddhists and adherents of all other faiths should pray. This insight can, I think, be the beginning for thinking of ways in which we can retain and strengthen the composite culture for which India is justly famous and which today faces greater peril than it ever has in the past.